major funding for American Makeover provided by Notre Dame School of Architecture, making places durable, beautiful, and sustainable. Additional support provided by Green Party Kits, committed to celebrating the value of reusing at greenpartykits.com. And from viewers like you. Thank you. has been called Sprawlanta, you know, it's the capital of sprawl. Look in the dictionary, it'll say see Atlanta. Rectangle, ripping it up, giving it up, yo, we living it up. In the late 90s, Chris Leinberger actually referred to Atlanta as the fastest growing human settlement in the history of the planet. Atlanta is the poster child of suburban sprawl, and it's everywhere. It's as far as the eye can go. Atlanta's been a classic example of the drive till you qualify affordable model, where the cheap land, the cheap housing is out at the edge. This is a metro region where only 10% of the population lives in the city proper. 90% lives in the outlying towns and, and communities. Extremely long commutes. The average employed Atlantan drives 66 miles a day. Got a question for you. I put it down with efficiency like think you want places. There are no natural boundaries to stop Atlantis growth. There are no mountains, there are no major oceans, and so there's nothing to say that we just won't sprawl to, uh, to the Atlantic Ocean. I mean, it's like, uh, never mind Charlotte and, and the rest of those cities in this way. Atlantans every day drive the distance cumulatively that would take us to the sun and part way back every single day. All of those cars burning lots of gasoline generate lots of pollution. As a matter of fact, in 2009, Forbes magazine rated Atlanta the most toxic city in the country. I'm breathing secondary smoke. No, I'm not talking about cigarettes. I'm talking about cars. We know more and more that both ozone and particulate matter are major hazards to respiratory and cardiovascular health. But that's not all. We know that being in a car is one of the most dangerous microenvironments we've got. Car crashes are the major cause of death among young people in this country. It's not just riding in a car that's dangerous all over Atlanta. You see folks trying to get across eight lanes of traffic, one lane at a time, like some sort of morbid version of the game Frogger. It, it takes a lot of strength from within to believe that the angels really got you covered. Three pedestrians are struck by automobiles every week in Atlanta. 60 people were killed by cars while on foot in 2008. Over a thousand people were injured. It's more than one Atlantan a week who's killed by a car because of the way we built the city. Margaret Mitchell, the author of Gone with the Wind, was killed crossing Peachtree Street, hit by a car. Several things happened kind of all at once that uh, introduced me to new urbanism. And somebody mentioned this book by Andres Duany or something, you know, they mispronounced his name. So I bought Suburban Nation, read it in a night, and I just got hooked. I mean, what do you have to do to become a developer? You just have to say you are one, and you are one, so. We stepped in, held a charrette at the very end of 01. You know, 02 was about permitting, and 03 was about infrastructure, and I think it was 04 when we started finally building the buildings, and here in 2010, it's mainly done.
My name is Kevin Clark. I'm a partner uh, with Historical Concepts. I'm an architect, a lead AP, uh, urban designer. You know, my, my background here is that, that I've been living here for about four and a half years uh, and, and have been working here for about three and a half. Colonial Park is so unique. It's right here in town. We're a mile and a half from the state capitol. Every resident has a place to grab coffee, grab a bite to eat. My 200-foot walk to work is, is pretty unique, I would say, among Atlantans and, and, and probably most folks. Prior to this, I was actually commuting about 35 miles one way uh, to the office. You know, one of the great things is the happenstance. Uh, occurrences. It's running into my neighbor as, as he's getting home from work and, and walking into his condo and he says, hey, do you want to grab a beer later tonight? Or, hey, we're playing trivia at the, at the Mexican restaurant. You want to you come and you know, grab an enchilada and have a beer? Absolutely. If I, if I had lived more of a suburban lifestyle, uh, if I would pass one of my neighbors, the way I would say hi to him is by honking my car. <laughs> you know, think about the difference of honking your car at somebody versus waving and saying hi, uh, have a conversation with them. And so on and so forth. To me, the key concept is walkability. And what makes for walkability? Well, one thing is there has to be somewhere to go. So that means compact and your destinations aren't too far away. It means there's a mix of different elements, a park, recreational facilities. And it's an, an empirical fact that for a place to be walkable, it has to be interesting and beautiful. And clearly it has to be safe, safe from crime, and even more importantly, safe from the damn cars. And so getting the whole street geometry thing right becomes incredibly critical. If you drive down some of the subdivisions that we would associate with, really with sprawl, you often find snout houses where the garage is really what projects out from the body of the house and the garage is the most visible thing. It looks like cars live there. You know, back behind the garage, maybe you find the front door to the house. Whereas if you go to places like Glenwood Park or more traditional neighborhoods, you see porches that are not for cars, they're for people. Garages are in the back that allows you to, to keep the trash and, and the kind of ugliness off the street. And really what it does is it, it gets you to use your front door a lot more. Here, I probably knew five or six people within the first day. Uh, and I continue to know my neighbors. Uh, I know their families, I know their stories, I know their jobs, they know mine. Great neighborhood, uh, it's very convenient to everything. It's always somewhere to go and eat, yeah, somewhere we, to talk to. I think the actual design it's more of a community-based design where you have your retail, your food, and all that stuff like contained within a small area versus suburbia where you have to drive maybe two, three miles to get to your favorite restaurant or the closest restaurant, I, I should say, maybe not even your favorite. Neighborhoods like Glenwood incorporate many of the features that we increasingly recognize promote good health, more physical activity, more social interaction, helping to build community also, something that's very good for health, less driving, which improves air quality, less driving, which reduces the risk of being in car crashes, and so on. So this is, is a, an example of a neighborhood design that incorporates many strategies that really are public health strategies. I did, actually, I did, I did clock it when I, when I first moved here. I lost 10 pounds in the, first, in the first six months that I lived here. Didn't change my diet, didn't change anything. Um, it was just, uh, just a different way of living. This, this notion that new urbanism is all about some heavy-handed government thing forcing people to do something they don't want to do, that really <laughs> aggravates me. I mean, all we have ever looked for was just permission to be allowed to do it. I mean, people wanted it. But in many ways, what we wanted to do was illegal. The mixed use is illegal. It's not in the zoning code. The street dimensions, which you really require, are illegal. They're prohibited by the municipality. Why can't we just at least make it legal? Additional funding for American Makeover is provided by the Fund for the Environment and Urban Life and the Congress for the New Urbanism.